Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from across the world. Our headlines. In Brazil, MST's Quilombo Campo Grande camp resists eviction in the midst of the pandemic. Haitian teachers protest school reopening. Oil workers in Nigeria call for strike over lack of pay. And protests continue against the re-election of President Alexander Lukashenko in Belarus. We begin with Brazil, where the Quilombo Campo Grande camp is currently resisting an attempted eviction, which began early on Wednesday, August 12th. The camp is home to 450 landless families. Dozens of police officers and vehicles were brought in from neighboring cities to carry out the action. While the governor of the state has said yesterday that the eviction would be halted, police forces have been deployed again today. In 1998, 450 landless families occupied land belonging to a mill in the city of Campo de Mayo in the southern part of the Minas Gerais state. The order to repossess the land was issued by a court despite the fact that the state had declared a situation of public calamity due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The order decrees the removal of the homes of the families as well as the structure of the Eduardo Galeano Popular School. The families have resolved to stand their ground and are attempt to nego attempting to negotiate to remain in the camp. According to those living in the camp, the police entered the homes yesterday armed with rifles and pistols, breaking down doors and windows. The MST denounced that the day before the eviction, the police surrounded the camp with vehicles and drones, intimidating the families. The camp, the Quilombo Campo Grande, is home to one of the largest coffee cooperatives in the state. The co cooperative produces 510 metric tons of coffee a year. In today's COVID-19 update, the number of total reported cases globally increased to 20.1 million, with the total number of deaths reaching 747,000. Peru is witnessing a devastating second wave of infections, with nearly 7,000 cases being reported every day. New Zealand has also witnessed a second wave of infections 102 days after the spread of the first wave was brought under control. In our In Focus section, we bring you an interview with Matheus Falcao of the People's Health Movement of Brazil on the government's flawed response to the pandemic. In the past couple of days, Brazil has overcome the very worrisome milestone of over 100,000 deaths from COVID and over 3 million confirmed cases. So what is the current situation looking like? Has Brazil reached the peak yet? What are infection rates looking like? If you can give us a general kind of uh, scope of what's happening across the country. Yeah, so indeed it's a very hard situation. Um, Brazil is a great, it's a big country with more than 200 million people. So it would look like, like a country that would have a lot of cases. But actually, it has, um, it's one of the countries that has more cases per person as well. And it's basically due to uh, bad uh, pandemic handling by the central government. Uh, there's no evidence for now that we have reached the peak or that we are close uh, to flatten the curve. Um, it's very important to, to keep in mind that Brazil is a very big country and it has uh, a lot of difference between regions. Uh, which include healthcare infrastructure, uh, social inequalities, a uh, bunch of inequities. So now uh, we will see some uh, regions in Brazil, especially the big cities where the pandemic has started here, like Sao Paulo, for instance, the city where the pandemic indeed start, that uh, are close to reach like perhaps the peak or even uh, to flatten the curve. But what we see now is that the, pan the pandemic in Brazil is moving uh, towards the countryside part. So we see an increase of cases in medium cities and small cities, uh, which is dangerous as well because sometimes the city doesn't have uh, a, a good inf healthcare infrastructure like the, the capitals, the big cities. And this would be the movement now. Uh, it's, import it's important to notice as well that uh, each uh, state or municipality in Brazil has such an autonomy, we'll talk about this later, I guess, but an autonomy to create its own policies in terms of pandemic handling. Uh, so we see this difference as well uh, across the territory. In our next story, several dozen teachers and activists organized a rally on Monday, August 10th, outside the Haitian Ministry of National Education and Professional Training. They were protesting against a decision taken unilaterally by the Minister of Education to reopen schools. The decision was taken without consulting other actors who are crucial to the proper functioning of the education system. They also demanded better working conditions for teachers in Haiti. The National Union of Haitian Teachers has been demanding a reasonable salary for the teachers as well. The placards of the protesting teachers read, When will schools in the poor neighborhoods be opened? No schools without security. And the issue of public insecurity was central to the demands. According to the Johns Hopkins University COVID-19 dashboard, 
Haiti has 7,743 confirmed cases of coronavirus and 187 deaths. Nigerian oil workers began a three-day strike at the Petroleum Ministry, demanding the payment of three months of wages. The strike was called by members of the Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association of the country. Work has been stopped at more than three state agencies under the ministry, including the Department of Petroleum Resources. The Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association of Nigeria and the Nigeria Union of Petroleum and Natural Gas Workers accused US oil major Chevron of attempting to sack thousands of Nigerian workers in violation of their contracts. Nigeria gets 90% of the country's foreign exchange from oil exports. These exports have taken a toll due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the fall in crude oil prices during March. The union has threatened to shut down and withdraw from the oil fields if the demands are not met. And finally, protests are continuing in Belarus over the alleged rigging in Sunday's election in which President Alexander Lukashenko won his sixth term. The second protester died on Wednesday, August 12th in clashes between the police and the protesters. The 25-year-old died in police custody in Gomel for unknown reasons. Another person had died earlier in Monday in the capital Minsk during the protests. Thousands of women dressed in white clothes were marched on the streets of Minsk on Wednesday denouncing state repression against the protesters. The protests erupted soon after the declaration of the results of presidential elections on Sunday. In the elections, President Alexander Lukashenko, who has been in power since 1994, won with 80% votes. His nearest rival, Svetlana Tikonskaya, got around 10% of the votes. Claiming a threat to her life, she has left the country and is currently in Lithuania. Lukashenko has claimed that foreign forces are behind the protests. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Yeah,